Hello and welcome to the video about fish. Now you have the notes about fish. It's quite a long set of notes actually. I'm not going to go through and read every single line because you can read them yourselves. But I'm going to go through, talk about some of the key ideas, help you fill in the blanks along the way, and um, then you will have a really good understanding of what fish are and how they do what they do and all that good stuff. So. Let's go ahead and get started. So what are the main characteristics of fishes? And you will notice that fish used to be the only accepted plural for fish, but we now accept fishes as well. So some of the main characteristics of fish are that they have an endoskeleton. In other words, the skeleton is on the inside. They have gills. They have a closed, a closed loop circulation. What that means is that their blood can circulate throughout their entire body. They also have kidneys, and as we're going to talk about and we're going to see um, a little bit later in this, the kidneys are a key to this organism's survival, along with the gills. They sort of work together. Um, a super interesting thing about fish is that they are the most ancient vertebrates around. So as you can see here in this picture, this is of a fossilized bony fish in particular because you can see all the bones that are there. Uh, there's a couple of them in that also. Today we have a huge diversity in fish and these are due to the fact that we have fresh water and salt water and that we have varying temperatures throughout the whole world. And so fish have to be able to um, survive in those temperatures, or of course their species would go extinct. So we're gonna look a little bit more specifically about some of their structures that they have. So what structures do fish have that they use to swim and sense their environment? As I said before, they have an endoskeleton. An endoskeleton is internal, okay? Um, and it could be made of either cartilage or bone. It also has fins. So we have fins here on the top. We have fins here on the belly. And these fins increase stability. They help them turn, dive, climb rapidly. They really help them maneuver quickly in their environment when necessary. Many fish also have a swim bladder. The swim bladder is pointed out here in the picture as this little part here. And the swim bladder is, as I say, a gas-filled sac that allows them to dive, turn, or climb rapidly. And the way that this works is it keeps, when the um, fish breathes in, some of the gases that it breathes in go to the fish bladder when needed in order to change its level in the water. Not all the time, because they don't always need this, but what the fish bladder also does is it allows them to stay at a particular level in the water so that they can avoid predators or stay where there's the most light or the most food that they need. Another thing fish have are really cool sense organs called lateral line. And their lateral line is a small series of canals and it typically goes about here across the fish. And they are lined with sensitive cells that detect vibrations in the water. And what that allows them to do, of course, is to determine when a predator is coming, also determine when prey is around, and um, keeps them oriented correctly. So how do they obtain oxygen from their environment? Well, they get all the oxygen they need from the water. The major respiration or respiratory organ of the fish is the gill. Okay, the gills are made up of rows of filaments, and you can see here in this picture, they've sort of cut away the skin, and you can see these rows of filaments here on the gills. And the gills, these filaments are the finger-like projections that gases can enter and leave the blood through. So it's basically like a series of um, pipe cleaners, if you want to think of it like that, that go around the gills and they allow the gas to be absorbed into it. The filaments hang between the fish's mouth and cheeks. And this is an important place for it because at the back of the 
fish's cheek is what we have what we call a gill slit. It is technically an opening that allows water to leave the fish. The gill slit is right here. Right by the blue arrows there. Now, one of the other really cool things about the gill slits and how this works with the mouth and why the gills are between the mouth and the cheek is because when the fish opens and closes its mouth, its mouth, it allows lots of water to go in and it drives what we call these countercurrent flows. And the countercurrent flow is when the water passes over the gills in one direction, the blood flows in the opposite direction direction through the gills capillaries, which allows oxygen to diffuse into the blood over the entire length of the capillary. So rather than there just being one particular part of the capillary of the blood, um, blood vessels that allows the oxygen to come through, the entire capillary can get oxygen. So all of these um, little red parts here on the gills where the capillaries are, are able to get oxygen in there. The gills, fish gills can extract up to 85% of dissolved oxygen, which is huge in the water that passes through them. The reason they can get this much, however, is because of this countercurrent flow. If we didn't have the countercurrent flow, the fish wouldn't be able to get that much water across their gills at one time. Now, the other cool thing that fish have is this single loop blood circulation. Fish have very simple chamber pump hearts, and the blood collects in the heart's atrium. The ventricle pumps the blood back to the gills and completing that single loop. All fishes except lungfish have single loop circulation. So it's that pump back through the capillary system that allows the countercurrent flow to work because of the gills allowing the oxygen to come through and the water to come through and the oxygen to be absorbed. So very simple situation going on here, but highly effective for fish, especially considering the fact that they can get 85% of the oxygen out of the water. It's pretty cool, really. But, as we all know, and as I'm sure one of you, at least one of you, is going to ask, what about the fact that some of them are in salt water and some of them are in fresh water? The question then becomes, how do they maintain their salt and water balance? Because just like us, we have to make sure we have the right amount of salt and water in our system in order so that we don't get dehydrated. Similarly, fish do too. You wouldn't think this would be a problem because they live in water all of the time. However, because of the fact that there's salt in their system or in their environment, they have a little bit of a different situation than we do. So the gills are super important, but another key to them being able to keep this salt and water balance is a pair of kidneys. Every fish has to deal with the problem of water loss. Osmosis is when you have water moving through the membrane, such as gills and the skin, towards regions of higher ion concentration. What's that, what that means is that water is going to move to wherever there is more salt or ions. Now that's a problem. If you're a salt water fish, the water in your body is then going to move out of your body into the ocean because that's where there's more salt. If you are a freshwater fish, then you're going to get more water coming into you because there's more salt inside of you than in your fresh water. So this picture here does a pretty good job of showing how this all works. It's cause osmo it, it is called, sorry, it is called osmoregulation in a marine fish versus osmoregulation in a freshwater fish. The osmo means osmosis, and regulation is what it's doing. It's regulating the salt and the water. So looking at this little key here, we have the fish opening its mouth. It gets water and salt ions from drinking the seawater and from the food. And then as it goes through the gills, he excretes salt ion, ions from the gills. And there's an osmotic water loss through the gills and other parts of the body's surface. And then, of course, when he goes to the bathroom, he excretes salt ions and small amounts of water in scanty urine, which means that when urine is produced in 
um, saltwater fish, there is a high concentration, small amount of urine with a high salt concentration. So these guys have small amounts of urine with high salt concentration. But if we look at our freshwater fish, they gain water and some ions from their food, not much at all, but they take salt ions in from the gills, whereas the marine fish excrete the salt, the freshwater fish take the salt along with the oxygen from the water or from the food itself. So there's an osmotic water gain through the gills and other parts of the body surface. When they go to the bathroom then, they want to get rid of all that extra salt and all that, sorry, they want to get rid of all that extra water. So they excrete salt ions, a few extras, with large amounts of water. So the freshwater fish excrete larges, large amounts of dilute urine. meaning lots of water, not nearly as much salt, okay? So salt concentration of fresh and seawater fish is here. What this does is it means that because their systems have to work pretty much opposite to keep this salt, water, salt and water balance correct, most fish cannot live in both salt water and fresh water. There are some, for example, salmon can. Salmon live part of their lives in the ocean and part of their lives in the rivers when they go up river to spawn, and we're going to talk about that next. But for the most part, fish cannot switch what type of water they live in. So how do fish reproduce? Well, most of them reproduce sexually through external fertilization. And what that means is that when they're, we call it spawning. So what happens is the male and female gametes, or the egg and the sperm, are released near each other in water. So spawning is the release of egg and sperm near each other in the water. And as you can imagine, this would mean that there have to be hundreds of thousands of eggs and sperm released near each other to make sure that enough of them get fertilized to be able to keep the species going. Now there are, um, this picture here is a picture of a spawning mass of eggs. There's the female fish there, the male fish um, is not quite in this picture, and they just release all the eggs and sperm very short period of time after each other in the same vicinity, and then this mass of eggs um, will become fertilized, or at least many of them will, and then they will go on to develop into fish. If we have um, lots of fish in the same area, then the spawning may just be rampant all over the place. So it's not like fish find a mate in particular. Most of the time, they just spawn in areas where there are other spawns of their same, other fish of their same species who are spawning at the same time. So one batch of eggs from one female fish could be fertilized from a number of different um, sperm from different fish. So it's not like you have brothers or sisters per se for most of them. In sharks, skates, and rays, the eggs are fertilized inside the female's body. In order for that to occur, the males have to have an organ that allows the sperm to get into the female body. And that is what a clasper is called. Is. So claspers allow sperm to be deposited in the female body. And again, this is for shark skates and rays. Most of the other fish do external fertilization. Now let's look at some different groups of fish. We are now currently on, I think, the fourth page of the packet. Yeah, I think it's the third or fourth page of the packet. Um, section two, groups of fishes. What are the characteristics of jawless fish? Here are two beautiful pictures of jawless fish. We have the hagfish on the left and the lamprey on the right. If you've ever done any research on these guys, they're actually pretty gross, in my opinion. Um, jawless fish 
have skeletons that are made of cartilage. Skeletons made of cartilage, which is very strong, fibrous, connective tissue. It's what we have in our tips of our noses and in our ears. Um, so they are the only modern vertebrates without a backbone. They are primarily very primitive. They have changed very little. Um, the, as I said, the hagfish and the lampreys are two examples. Hagfish are scavengers as well as predators. And the lampreys are parasitic. Um, and their suction cup mouth attaches themselves to the host. And then they have a... Um, like a tooth at the end, a spear tooth at the end of their tongue, which they then bore into their prey to suck their blood. So they don't eat the fish that they bore into, they just suck their blood. And they typically don't end up killing the fish either. So they'll attach themselves onto the other fish that they're going to eat, and they drill a hole into the blood stream, and then they suck out the blood only enough for what they need. And if it's a larger fish, the fish survives. If not, then the fish dies. But if the fish survives, they then have a gaping hole in their side, which makes it more likely that they will, in fact, end up dying along the way. So it's pretty ingenious evolutionary tactic, but um, they're pretty mean, too, that way. Some main treats of cartilaginous fish, fishes. Number one is that they have paired fins and jaws. They also have, um, again, cartilage uh, skeletons, but their cartilage has some calcium carbonate in it. Calcium carbonate is an important um, material because it hardens things up. It's like what oyster shells are made of. And as it says in your notes, shark, skates, rays, and ratfishes are all cartilaginous fish. Shark teeth, however, are not teeth like our teeth. They are actually just modified scales. There are 10 rows of them, 6 to 10 rows of them, in a shark's jaw, which is why they can chomp such deep flesh like getting into a um, seal skin, getting through the blubber, because cause they have so many rows of teeth. Sharks are not all predators, however. Um, most of them are, but the largest sharks, like the whale sharks, only consume plankton. Skates and rays are um, in this grouping of cartilaginous fish, but they have flat, bod flat bodies because they live on the seafloor. And along with their flat bodies, they have those flattened teeth because then they can just chomp on things that also live on the seafloor. Finally, why have bony fish been so successful compared to other groups of fishes? There are a whole heck of a lot more bony fish than there are of cartilaginous fish, but why? What's going on here? Well, we know for one thing that the bony fish have their endoskeleton made completely of bone and not um, cartilage. They also have lateral lines opercula, and swim bladders. Um, the lateral lines are, um, as we said before, they are sensing mechanisms that allow the fish to know where they are and how fast they are moving and how fast other things are moving. Sort of like a GPS system. The operculum is um, the singular of opercula. The operculum is the hard plate that covers the gills. The reason that they need this is because it allows the water to be pushed in. It's sort of like a, a vise that's pushing the water through. Bony fish also have their swim bladder. This regulates their buoyancy and um, it allows them to change their depth. Their paired fins allow them to turn and paddle backwards, which, which of course means that they can continue to face their prey, the predator, as they move away from it, um, because they don't want to have to turn around and not know where their predator is. Because of the fact that bony fish have the operculum, or operculum, 
per fish. They don't have to swim forward with the mouth open to get the water over their gills like sharks do. Okay, And of course we said that the swim bladder regulates the buoyancy inside their fins. They're not just flaps of skin and scales. Inside their fins they have bony structures that are called rays. This allows them to move more water past them and move faster. We then also have these things called teleosts. They are a type of fish. They are the ray-finned fish. Highly mobile fins, thin scales, symmetrical tails, um, 95% of all living fish species are teleosts. Okay? The other type of fish are lobe-finned fish, and the lobed-finned fishes are very different. They have lots of fleshy muscular, they have fleshy muscular fins supported by bones instead of supported by rays. Okay, so there are only seven species of lobe-finned fish. So most of the fish you are familiar with are the teleosts, 95% of them, as I said. Okay, so obviously that's more evolutionarily advantageous than having a lobed fin fish. So if we're looking at the evolutionary time scale here, then chances are that the swim bladder occurred was a um, speciation event that occurred um, between sharks and fish. S similarly, the evolution of rays in the fins, the bony structures in the fins, would have occurred after the lobe-finned fishes had evolved so that they would become um, more advantageous and they could survive better. But those seven species of lobed fin fishes obviously live in an area of the ocean or lake or river where it's more advantageous for them not to have rays, but to have those strong, bony, um, and lots of flesh on their fins. So we'll talk a little bit more about what those are later. That should answer, fill in all of the blanks on your fishes notes. Please hang on to these notes and make sure that you have them because you will need to refer to these parts of fish and understand how these fish works over the next few days when we are going to start doing some fish labs and looking at how they fit into our tree of life.